Well, good afternoon, everyone. To kind of honor everyone's time, we want to get um, started. Um, but we are so glad that on this snowy day, if you're somewhere in Cleveland or the Northeast Ohio, you are getting dumped on. Uh, so thank you for taking your time to be with us today. Um, we really hope that this next 45 minutes together, um, you learn something, we learn something, um, and can support one another. So uh, today we have, um, my name is Lanny Davis Frecker. I am the president and CEO of Julie Billiard Schools. I started as a teacher. Um, I feel it is my life's work to work with this type of learner. Um, and I am so honored to have a co-presenter um, as a fellow. She is on our board of directors. Uh, she is also a alumni parent um, and has become a dear friend of mine. So Becky Dellinger, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I'll just chime in. So I first met Lanny um, even before my son started in her kindergarten class at Julie Billiard School. Um, she's been a, a gift to, to really our whole family and, and navigating many things um, you know, around my kids. I am a parent of uh, two children, both adopted from Guatemala, and both have learning differences. Um, my older son is is the ADHD kid um, with some difficulties focus, focusing, and my younger son is uh, at speech apraxia and is on the autism spectrum. Uh, both, by the way, are now, uh, well, my older son is 19 and my younger son is 17. So um, I've been on a longer journey and um, you know, jumping back to sort of early childhood, at least I know how the story ends and, and or, or the story continues and it's a good story. Um, but early on, I, I think I had to have one foot in denial and the other foot in panic much of the time. So, um, so I'll share those experiences. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Betsy. And also thank you for dating me when you said you're <laughs> now everyone knows. Anyway, um, so really today this is just about kind of what we want to cover. Um, I think, you know, person to person, human to human, uh, we really just want to provide you some snippets of hope. Um, as Betsy said, you know, the early journey when you're um, getting a diagnosis or in that process or even just investigating, um, it can be overwhelming at times. So we hope to provide you some um, snippets today um, and just reassurance that there's people who have walked this journey. Um, like Betsy, there's organizations like JB that have made it their work to support the families who are going through this. Um, so also just a, a quick housekeeping. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please just put them in the Q&A box and we will get to them as many as we can or um, email you directly at the end. Um, so early signs and signals, Betsy. Yeah, you want me to jump in? So first of all, you know, um, bringing my kids home when, when they're younger, very honestly, everything um, both of my sons did struck me as completely amazing, right? <laughs> and it is only when you start like putting them next to uh, more traditionally developing kids that you think, hmm, that seems a little off or that's a little different. And then when you start having conversations around it uh, with your friends, you know, it, it crystallizes a little bit, but it's, it's a journey. It's, it's not a moment, right? Um, I would say that, you know, really early on for my older son, um, his level of activity was pretty obvious from day one. Um, he always wanted to be carried. He never wanted to sleep. He was in constant motion. He didn't stick with anything at one particular time. Um, you know, at the age where he should be able to go get his shoes and, you know, come bring them back for help putting them on, that could be a, a half hour adventure of, of different activities on the way to find one or two shoes. Um, not a great listener, um, but super charming and fun. And I guess, you know, for him, you know, one of the, uh, the eye opening moments is when his preschool teacher said, you know, we were talking about whether he was kindergarten ready. And she said, I think you need to give your son the gift of an extra year of preschool. Right. So some of the things you see yourself, you're getting some feedback from from people around you. And it, it, I'm a little ADHD in, in my own you know, self-diagnosis. So that really wasn't a problem. But but it was a thing that I had some awareness or had to have some awareness of um, for my younger son. You know, when he uh, we first I first brought him home at eight months um, with his adoption and he you know, I would have described him as solemn, but content. Right. Um, you know, a little bit more of a loner. Uh, and, and I sort of thought, was that some of the adoption or was that sort of who he was? But as it evolved, 
it became like, you know, he was sort of really easy on the home front because you could set him down with a couple favorite toys and he could keep himself entertained for two hours. So you could fold your laundry or you could do this or you could do that. And it was great. But also that that inkling in my mind of, hmm, this is so different than my other son. Is this a thing with him or is this this thing with my other son or is a little bit of both, right? So I sort of had that, you know, uh, my, my radar was up, but I wasn't putting real words um, and things real concrete to it. Uh, he did have favorite things. He loved his trains. Um, and by the way, he still sort of likes trains. But uh, I was so proud of him when he would line them all up. And honestly, I could come home from work and there would be like a half mile of train Thomas the train tracks all assembled throughout the living room, the kitchen, the back room. And uh, he had spent all day on it. Um, and it was both amazing and you know, sort of stunning. Um, and then, of course, when you couldn't find that last piece of the train track to connect it or the dog bumped into it and knocked it over, it could be a bit of a disaster. Um, but but he loved his trains. He loved books. And you think, great, kids loving books is fantastic. But he liked like the telephone book or he liked like dictionaries, which, again, not really a problem on the home front, but maybe a little atypical. So I was seeing things like that. And then the the big one that it kept me awake at night um, early on was his social interactions. You know, he did a great job with his brother, a great job with me. Pretty much everything beyond that was a bit of a social disaster. So, you know, it would be, you know, tackling kids. The tackling thing was a big issue. Uh, doesn't go over well at the playground. So, you know, if you if you took him to the playground, you pretty much had to stay within about one you know, one foot of wherever he was in order to be the constant intervention. So it could be exhausting. Uh, and then in school, you know, when preschool started, you know, those social challenges um, took on a, a new, bigger, worse life and, you know, made it really obvious uh, that we needed to, to have some new tools and tactics. Yeah, so I think here, um, Betsy, thanks for sharing. I think it's really about early intervention. It's about, you know, those things that do keep you up at night, those, you know, trusting your gut as the mom, the caregiver, the dad, the parent. Um, I think it's just about knowing that those first conversations are important and that every kid is different, but when is it time to speak up and learn that this difference might actually be like a learning challenge? Um, so here's, you know, I think one of the things that's really critical that Betsy mentioned is looking at it across settings. So where they may be super comfortable at home, you may see a different kid when you take them to school. And so looking at across um, different settings uh, for some of these skills or deficits or early signals. Um, early development, I mean, this, this is a list of things that, you know, <laughs> my neurotypical daughter, I could go through and say she struggled in all of these areas as well. So these are certainly not diagnostic or at all the complete comprehensive list. But I think that what, what here is, know that different situations in your life um, can trigger any one of these. And so we're not talking about situational, we're talking about how it pertains to their learning and their development. Um, so things that can be traumatic to a child, and it's always in the eyes of that person, uh, trauma, you know, bringing home another sibling, uh, divorce, loss of a loved one, COVID has been traumatic for some kids and we have seen skill regression. Um, so just know that when you look at this list, but this is part of some of the early, early signs that you want to just start to take note of. Yeah, I'll just jump in for in my two kids, it, one or both of them hit almost all of these dots. And this is just a, a partial list. I probably never saw the regression in skill mastery because it was skill development that was that was slow in some cases for them. So I didn't really see that. Where I struggled with, you know, you can, you can see this list, you can see things online, your pediatrician can give you a list of things to watch for. Everything from my perspective as a parent, everything was a little bit relative, like difficulty attending tasks. Well, like what is the right expectation about how a child should attend to those tasks? Um, you know, sound letter correlations. Well, what is that really, how does that really translate to, to what I'm living with at home or what we're seeing at the grocery store and so forth? So that was, you know, taking a list like this and then looking at my child, I needed a lot of help and you know, bridging the gap between like, what does this statement say 
and what would a typically developing child do and where does my child line up against that? Um, and that's where really drawing on a community of people around me was helpful. And initially that community, sure, it was my pediatrician and, and my kids both had early speech therapy. The speech therapist was super helpful, but it was a lot of talking to my friends who either you know had kids the same age or older kids and they'd been through this journey who were compassionate, compassionate, you know, guidance on this topic. Some of them with, uh, you know, typically developing kids and some of them with atypically developing kids. So there was just sort of, I had to be a sponge for a lot of information in order to figure out how to, how to really digest this and these type of, um, uh, you know, lists of what things should be of concern. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really kind of our in school signs, you know, if your child is in a school setting and what it um, can look like. Um, Betsy, do you want to? Yeah, let me let me turn in. So at, by the time I was, you know, my, my older son and then my younger son, they're 18 months apart, we're getting ready for school. I already knew it wasn't going to be a cakewalk, right? You know, I, I had at that point spent, you know, three, four years, uh, you know, together with them um, with far more joys than challenges. Uh, but this was going to be that step where we had to really consistently be outside of the comfort of the four walls of our home, where I probably enabled them too much and where they felt really safe and secure to, to push them to start, you know, having a little independence in their life and, and settings outside the home. Um, so, so I knew this wasn't going to be easy, you know, first with my older son, um, who was the whirling dervish, you know, in preschool and then in kindergarten. Um, and what we saw with him, and, and this is where you start to get more objective feedback, right? Not just from, you know, grandparents and friends and neighbors who may be a little reserved, but by professionals and teachers who their job is in part to say, your kid's doing great at this and is struggling with this. Um, and this is what would be normal. And this is what we're seeing. And so, you know, with my older son, once we got into school age, certainly the uh, ability to focus was an issue. Um, he didn't have too many social challenges, but very early on was identified as have, you know, having pre-reading challenges and then reading challenges. Um, and, you know, what I tried to do there is just, you know, be open to it because these were people trying to help, not trying to label. Um, with my younger son, uh, I think, um, again, the, the son uh, on the spectrum, certainly his speech challenges were very evident early on. And he really wasn't able to speak a full sentence till about age five. And then the fairly simple sentences. Um, still not much of a talker at age 17, but he's a good communicator when he wants to. Um, but, uh, you know, the tackling was an issue, preschool is an issue. So, you know, for him, um, my education was not just support from the people around me, but a lot of false starts. So, you know, the first preschool was a giant disaster. Um, I got some good guidance, um, really from my older son's prior preschool, because I needed to find a, a resource about getting him into the public school system preschool, which was uh, an integrated program designed for some kids with special needs. And he spent an extra year there. And, you know, we, we did have, you know, I felt like a solid year of sitting in the hallway, slowly managing our way into the classroom every day to the end of his preschool experience, a place where he wanted to be and a structure that he understood and how to navigate. And then, you know, kindergarten was coming upon us. So I uh, had learned about Julie Billiard School. And uh, I took him to the screening, at which point he refused to walk into any of the classrooms to talk to any of the teachers. Uh, but but the, the teachers and the administrators at Julie Billiard reached out to him and uh, came and, and watched him in his preschool classroom and said, yeah, you know, this is a, a child who is... Uh, school ready, who does have school skills, has a lot of anxiety, um, which to the untrained eye probably would have looked like opposition. Um, the word no was, was certainly one of his favorites at that time, um, but it was really anxiety. So calming that anxiety helped him open up and, and uh, start to have school success. So, you know, that was a little bit of our journey from, you know, sort of early preschool into, you know, getting toe dipping into the, the school programs. Right. And I think part of what we also, you know, what Betsy touched on is that your right fit um, will will and is apt to change for your child. And there's there's many organizations out there. Um, JB is not the right fit for every child. We recognize that. Um, but we certainly have relationships with other organizations where these kids may be more successful. Um, and so I think that part of this is once you notice this, what are your options as a parent who knows what's best for my child? 
Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll even jump in here that, you know, at, at that point of the conversation with, you know, my community of, of friends and contacts, now I was sort of becoming friends of friends I was getting introductions to. And the closer I got to a parent that was a couple of years ahead of me with a child somewhat like mine, those conversations started becoming much more valuable. Um, you know, I sort of was aware of Julie Billiard School, but where it became really obvious is when I was talking to um, a friend of a friend at a church basketball game for the for kids. And her son was at Julie Billiard School. And my son was standing by himself in the middle of the basketball court, not knowing what to do, of course, um, you know, as all the other kids ran around and more of a team based social activity, playing basketball on the court. And, you know, I said, how's Will doing at uh, Julie Billiard? And she said, you should absolutely look at it. And you know, that started the dialogue and, you know, moved Julie Billiard from something I was aware of to like, wow, this might be really a good fit for us. So if you are in those kind of early years um, and you've noticed some of this, we recommend we're not, you know, on the diagnostic ends and we're not pediatricians, but we really do advise that that is the first place you start these conversations. Um, the conversations are hard. Um, we all have behaviors like that's human beings have behaviors. It's when the behaviors are disrupting the flow or the access to things that you really do need to take notice. Um, so I have a, a two-year-old son. Um, he's developed very differently than my four-year-old daughter. And I do this for a living, right? This is my life's work is to, to work with these kids. And I love these kids. And then I had my own kids and it pulled at my heart differently to be able to have a pragmatic conversation with a doctor about what my child was going through. I thought, did I do something wrong? Was it, you know, in utero, I did something. Did I eat something? You know, you, you go through these crazy thoughts in your head. And this is just the first conversation of many. So what I did is I started to take some data um, in my phone about across different settings, how uh, my son Dugan would respond to things. Um, and I presented it in a way to the pediatrician where I could ask good questions. I actually practiced the conversation um, with, a number of different people so that I didn't get emotional so that I could actually hear what the doctor said in response instead of putting up those defenses where it's like, no, my kid's pretty perfect or no, my kid is, you know, really needs help. I really wanted to be an active listener and I knew that I had to practice in order to do so. Um, so, you know, little things, um, the triggers of the behaviors or what I was noticing in different settings. Um, and then there's always this question because of what we've all been through is, is it COVID? Is it this lack of socialization for this much time? But, you know, it still was a big deal to us. So it was still important for me to bring up to um, our pediatrician. Yeah, I would, I would also say when you, you know, have, I did the exact same thing, um, you know, at some point really made a, this is what I'm seeing at home. And I put it in my own words, because I don't have to try to put it in the pediatrician's words. That's, that's his job. Um, but I put it in my own words. It was a super helpful conversation. It was actually a relief to really have that structured conversation with my pediatrician. And then, you know, what I saw, and, and I think it's important to remember, is that a diagnosis is not the end of the road. The diagnosis is the a step you take to getting the right support for your child, right? Um, because you know, the whole goal here is how can I help? How can I help my child feel comfortable in their own skin, succeed on the playground, do well in school? That, that's the, the purpose of the diagnosis so that you can start like using some common language with the people around you to, to bring all of that support to play so you can take your wonderful child and give them a wonderful experience. So. Um, help me grow. You want me to chime in on this, Lanny? Yeah. So, and then I, I had an experience with, with, with help me grow. That was very good. Um, uh, help me grow is a, a, I guess it's a statewide organization. So my older son, um, again, I mentioned he was adopted from Guatemala. He came home, you know, we did all the initial testing with the pediatrician and it was discovered. Um, I discovered it through a panicked phone call from my pediatrician that his lead level was high. So he had early lead exposure. So our doctor, uh, again, when he was about two, recommended, why don't you bring in Help Me Grow? It gives you just sort of a good perspective on meeting developmental milestones, 
Um, for those who know, with lead exposure, it can lead to developmental disabilities. It can lead to learning issues. And so, um, you know, be, be on the front end of that curve, particularly since we knew that there had been some lead exposure. Um, and my pediatrician at that point did also say, you know, if you see a learning disability or ADHD, that might be just who your son is, or it might be due to the lead. In either case, you're going to manage it the same way. So I brought in Help Me Grow, a very compassionate organization that came to our house. It was not scary for me. It was not frightening for my child. Um, I can still picture the woman and it was just sort of like your best friend walking in really and just spent some time and and brought some professional resources to um, you know what I was seeing they developed a, a, a very helpful report um, for us and I, I will say you know in hindsight I would read the report differently because at the time I read the report and go great she didn't like circle anything in red and say that this was a giant disaster so everything's sort of okay if I pulled up that report today and read through it again it would be more subtle in the, this is this seems a little light on, on this developmental milestone, seems to be missing this, had this unusual behavior, or you'd see things like that. And so with hindsight, I would go through it more carefully and highlight those things myself as things to keep a really close eye on and to probably bring forward more so um, with the speech therapist, the pediatrician, and if at that point I had um, other interventions, you know, get those higher on the list. So one, it was a really good experience. And second, with hindsight, I would have uh, taken that information and processed it, uh, I think, more effectively. Yeah, and um, I had an experience with Help Me Grow as well with my son after I talked to my pediatrician. And, you know, what I liked is they came in and they weren't like judging how clean my house was. They were instead really, you know, talking to my child in his own environment and were giving pretty unbiased benchmarks as to what I, you know, as the mom and, and my husband could look for, um, they gave us real-time answers. So right then and there, they told me if my child qualified for services, and this was all up until school age. And so it was a really nice barrier to have this because I know what to do once they're school age, because I'm in that world. But prior to that, it's hard. And when you know early intervention is the thing that is going to help your child, you want to get it, but where do you go? Um, mm -hmm. so Help Me Grow was just a really good connector for me. And they were a really good, you know, they handed the report and they showed, you know, where he was and, and kind of what next steps would be. Um, and again, in my experience, there was kind of no judgment, which was, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. Some of you uh, may be wondering, well, what happens if my child is school age? Um, and really, we will touch on this um, today and we will fully discuss this in a webinar um, that, a webinar session that's within this five series um, of webinars, but you know, kind of real quickly, um, you really do start with your district of residence. Even if your child is in a private school, it is your district of residence that you start the conversation with. Um, every child, every school district has a little bit of a different, you know, start here, start with this person. Um, but your rights as a parent for knowing your child needs an evaluation, those don't change. Um, so you can learn those rights. There's tons of supports from a state perspective on that um, and from an advocacy perspective, but each um, district will be unique in how you work with it. But really start the conversation with your you know, child's teachers, your child's administrators, definitely put some things in writing about what you're noticing as a parent and ask for the school's perspective on what they're noticing as well to start the dialogue with, let's, let's put some real um, unbiased assessments into place to see where my child is against where, you know, their, their neurotypical peers may be. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, sometimes people hear horror stories about the interface with the school system and special needs kids. My experiences with both of my kids over, you know, the last, you know, decade and a half have been really good. I felt like the school system, you know, uh, the professionals there were helpful. They had my child in mind. They were timely. Um, they were compassionate. Uh, so I've had very good experiences. So I, people have had different experiences than mine, but I can give you at least one example where I felt that the public school district um, really had the same interest in mind, which is, you know, how do we best serve this child? And I think all, also it must be noted that, you know, Betsy, your approach with your school district was really partnership. I mean, you, you did it as a partnership. If, mm -hmm. if you 
to know what's and want what's best for my child and I want what's best for my child. Let's come together, ask good questions, listen to one another um, and do what we set out to do. Uh, I, I had the great privilege here to serve as the director of special ed and that's how I approached the districts as well. Because if you are on a scholarship, you're working with the district of residence for the ETR, the IEP. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, just again, asking good questions, being thoughtful in your approach and knowing that there is not one school that can do everything for every child mm -hmm. so to believe in and support other types of educational um, opportunities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And I'll just, I'll just add to that, that the, um, sometimes when it, at, at certain levels, well, actually really at all levels in the, in the evaluation process, you're going to be faced with some objective measures of the child's performance. And those can be a bit demoralizing, right? When you see, at least from both of my kids, parents, you see your ch children in the numbers because the numbers tell just such a small part of their whole story and it's not the best part of their story. Um, so that can be demoralizing. So out of some of those meetings, I had to take the deep breath, go hug my kids and then look at all the amazing yeah. things that they're doing and know that they're a whole person who is going to grow up into a successful, fulfilled adult um, and that that information is really just a tool to help them navigate to that, not not a, a judgment or a, or a ceiling on what they can do. Right. And those processes, I mean, those are deficit processes. So you're, you're really intentionally pointing out the deficits of kids and putting them on paper. So it is hard. It's mm -hmm. hard to watch. It's hard to be part of. You know, I brought a picture of kids to those meetings. Like we're not just talking about paper that defines a kid. We're talking about this little face. Um, because it's so important for us to know that they're a whole person on top of that. And yeah, maybe they struggle to read, but they also love horses and they love to do this with their brother. And so, um, you know, I've always really uh, appreciated how you, Betsy, have kept that in perspective with your kids. Um, here are just some references, some resources, some suggested readings. The list is exhaustive, but these are some that we do feel are helpful. Um, and, you know, Julie Billiard Schools has a fantastic website and there's resources that are also um, listed on there that may help you in your journey. Um, but sometimes just being able to call someone and um, speak with someone is, is meaningful in your journey. Um, there are five more episodes in our series. These are the next two. Um, and again, you know, JB is wants to be part of these conversations, wants to be part of, of your journey as you figure out what is best for your child because uh, we, we care and this is what our organization was set out to do. So now we can kind of move into the um, questions portion. We are amazingly right on schedule because uh, Betsy and I can talk like none other. Um, so, so one of the questions that we got, um, and Beth, you may be helpful here too, is what do we do if our older child, um, a second grader, uh, we are noticing some of these signs now that they're in second grade? I'll just jump in. I think you do the same things as if you noticed them when you were earlier. You, you know, um, uh, start writing down what you're seeing, what you're hearing from the teachers, have some objective conversations with the teams around you, which at that point, if you haven't had big problems before, it's probably your pediatrician and the school system. Um, and uh, you know, do the information gathering. And then um, it starts to get, if, if, if it's the public school or even some private schools uh, have the equivalent, um, they may talk about things like IEPs or special accommodations. And that gets to be part of the conversation. I wouldn't stop the conversation there because what you really want to do is you know, not just accommodate, but you want to understand too. Um, but I think it's the same process. It's the same conversation. Um, it's just they're, they're interacting more with the outside world there. So you're going to get more external input. Mm -hmm. uh, another person asked, um, what if your child attends a private school, but you suspect a disability? Uh, do you still go through the district? I have heard that private schools, not JB, tell parents that they don't do IEPs. Can I go first? Yes. Um, 
so I was one of those parents who said, oh, I'm, you know, going to send my kids to, you know, a private preschool because it's awesome and it's private. And you know what, that I, I'm embarrassed that at one point I, I had that mindset because what I quickly learned is that, you know, that was a huge disaster, a, a mild disaster for my older son, a big disaster for my younger son, and that the right place was in the program that was designed to support their needs, not the program that I thought was the best program, right? So the public school district had the integrated preschool programs and was just fantastic, it, almost life-changing, um, and got us through that stage to the next one. So we did get feedback uh, from one private preschool that they did provide these services. They honestly didn't even really know what early intervention services were for children. And, and I, I would fault them on that because if you're working with young children, even if they're not children you're serving, you sort of, it's a lot of families first exposure to the school age really helps if you know what the resources are in the community. So if you can't serve that child, where to send a family as their next step. So I found those resources and I, and I did that. Um, my older son, um, my younger son was obviously at Julie Billiard School. My, my older son was in more traditional programs and all of those programs um, in independent schools did have some type of support um, for him. So he was in those schools. And then in high school, he ended up going to a school specially designed for kids with learning needs. So I got the, the, the programs and the support along the way. It looks a little different in private schools and public schools, but it was there. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add is when they're saying that they don't do IEPs, it's because an IEP, an individualized education plan, is really a, a school document um, that you know really is a responsibility of the public school to offer your child that free appropriate public education. A private school has something called a service plan, typically, and it's essentially the same thing without less, with less um, legalese attached to it. Um, but there's still, you know, hopefully trying to obtain um, data that shows that they're working towards um, the goals and the objectives and the services that are under that plan. Um, there's always an opportunity to get an independent evaluation. So there are groups, sometimes your insurance may even cover it. Um, for you to go out and get an independent evaluation for someone else to look and say, you know, we're going to do a, a litany of tests and we're going to take some really um, unbiased scores and we're going to put them against their the norms of their peers um, and give you a recommendation for if there is uh, a disability um, that your child is struggling with. Um, another question is, can help me grow start at the age of 18 months? I have two kids already on the spectrum and my third one is having a few symptoms as well. Um, in my understanding, help me grow will evaluate at the 18 month year old level. Um, I'm sure their website would tell you that, but I believe that they, they will because they're pre school age um, developmental. My understanding is yes, and you should uh, maybe give them a call. Um, then we have tips for me as an early childhood educator who wants to go into the special education field after I get my associate's degree based on this topic. I think that so, one's for you, Lanny. <laughs> yeah, so tips. Um, obviously, uh, my, much of my heart is still in the classroom. Um, our teachers are amazing because they bring out the gifts in our kids. So something that I think the best teachers do is they find the thing that the child is good at, no matter what the category says, they get to know the child, they find what they're good at, and they communicate that to the parents. Because when that parent feels that you see the good in their child and that you see, um, you know, the things that they love, the things that make them tick beyond this category, um, I think that then the parent is willing to team with you differently. And so the best thing for that child is to have the parent support the teacher who can support the child. Um, so it really is about that whole relationship. Um, and I would say to find that early on and communicate it with, with, teacher, with the parents. Do you have anything there, Betsy? I think, you know, be sure to, you know, celebrate the everyday successes the child has in the classroom, because um, 
you know, if the test scores don't tell this fantastic story, it doesn't mean the child's not learning and growing. So celebrate those successes and, you know, bring a lot of patients to the classroom. One example I can give, and I think Lanny's heard me say this before, is when Autumn was in kindergarten, Lanny's co-teacher, you know, would take the kids to the library and my son would every day pick out a train book, right? And he said, well, maybe we need to pick out a book, not about trains. So I think Jason sat with, with my son on the step, you know, the library crying for about 30 minutes. Jason wasn't crying, I don't think, but my son clearly was. And, um, and after 30 minutes, my son went and picked out a second book that wasn't a train book. That was a huge success for him because it, you know, pulled him a little out of his comfort zone. Um, and uh, it's that type of like everyday success that makes a huge difference. Um, we have another question, um, which says, what professional can perform these evaluations for you? Um, I think you're probably talking about maybe some of the independent evaluations that I was talking about. Um, a lot of times your neurologists, your pediatricians will have recommendations. I know that um, Akron Children's, we do uh, work with them and they have a center um, I'm blanking on the name um, in Akron that we, we send a lot of our families to who need um, to go through, you know, speech assessments and uh, fine motor assessments with an occupational therapist. And um, for a while, I know that Lawrence School was doing some of the evaluations. Um, Betsy, do you have any additions here? Yeah, no, you know, the, the public school systems do it through their, uh, their evaluation programs. And even if your kid goes to private school, the public school systems, if there's a reason to believe that there's a disability, will do those evaluations and they're pretty thorough. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's sort of the free resource. And then um, I would always go to my pediatrician and they would usually probably have a long list of, of resources for, for those types of evaluations also. Um, someone said, I am stressed about the next steps with my child. Um, what can I do besides talk to my pediatrician at my next well check? Um, so one of the things that I had mentioned was to use the uh, resources section of the JB website. Um, there are places like um, Connecting for Kids that we have a lot of respect for and we partner with them a lot. Um, Milestones um, is a great resource and they, they do really pride themselves on being a resource for parents who are journeying with a child who's somewhere on the spectrum. Um, and so they, those two are really great resources. Um, and then if your child is school age and you know maybe some of the things, some of the stories that Betsy said or some of the things that I said really resonated with you um, and your child is school age, call JB. Um, we have a fantastic admissions department and we um, would love to hear of your child's journey and help um, find the answer or be the answer to maybe what you're looking for. Yeah, I would say the pediatrician is an essential part of that team, but um, in some respects, you get more of the medical angle on that for the obvious reason. And sometimes you need a much bigger picture. So yeah, I, I would say, you know, reach out a lot of directions and see what is helpful. Talk to people, um, you know, in the community, if you can find other parents who, you know, march down that path a little bit, they can say, this was great. That wasn't so good. Um, I found a, a camp uh, for uh, kids on the autism spectrum that was like a weekly gym class thing and then a summer camp through a little flyer that was posted on the wall at the local school. And it's like, oh, that looks like it might be interesting. I followed up. And honestly, my son was involved on and off of that program for probably 10 years. Um, so it was a little bit like... Um, trying to have a lot of touch points and see which ones are, are most connecting. Um, but obviously also, if you have a child um, child or children on the spectrum, your day is pretty busy. It seems a little busier than, than you know, the average day. So I, I know it's hard. So, um, you know, there's, there's compassion around saying, you know, poke on a lot of different fronts and see what works. Um, so this is a, a wonderful, not a question, but just some more information for uh, the question that came in about help me grow working with the 18 month old child. Um, this person said the county um, early learning programs work with children birth to age three. Um, exiting process begins at around six months, 
before the child's um, first or the third birthday. So you may, that's another resource. Um, so thank you for that little snippet as well. Okay, it looks like we have time for um, one more question. Um, what if my doctor doesn't believe that there's an issue, but I know that there is? Well, Betsy, do you wanna take this first? Yeah, I mean, don't stop there. I it's the, you know, I, I sort of started this by men mentioning that, you know, balance between denial and panic. Um, you know, once that panic sets in, you spend more time with your child than anybody else. And, and you're going to know more. And the, you know, if, if your pediatrician should say, I'd say you just find, you know, have more conversations um, with different people. You know, if there's a multiple pediatrician practice, talk to some of the other doctors there ask, you know, say, I really want to do an assessment, you know, either I'll discover there's nothing wrong, which would be great news, or we'll discover there's some challenges or deficits. And I'm going to be glad I got that information and know something to do about it. So I, I would say, you know, don't don't end with one conversation. I, I know I'll give one example. And I love my pediatrician, but we uh, when after a year of speech therapy, the speech therapist said, I, you know, it was, she called and said, you know, I believe your son has something beyond speech delay, but speech apraxia, which is a, a neurodevelopmental issue. I took that to my pediatrician and he goes, oh, I'm not hearing it. And then he, in his medical training, was fully aware of the most severe cases of speech apraxia, but there were other you know, uh, meaningful disabilities associated with less severe cases that the speech therapist acknowledged. So I didn't stop with him saying, no, I don't see it. It's like, no, I, I have this year long relationship with this fantastic speech therapist and I, I believe here. So let's talk about how we intervene beyond this. What are the comorbidities that might come with it? And I just pushed the conversation. So. Yeah, and you trusted your gut as the person who is spending the most time um, mm -hmm. with, and you gave that great credence, so. Mm -hmm. um, so we did get through those questions. Um, you will get this email to you. Thank you so much for your time today, um, for spending it with us, whether this was your lunch hour or just a couple minutes um, away from the craziness of your life. Thank you for being with us. And we hope we can see you again in one of our future webinars. Thank you and be safe out there.